uh, at least allow me to catch you up to where we are. Uh, and even for those who may need handouts from the previous weeks, uh, we'll be able to provide those to you uh, at the latest by Sunday. So those of you who have been with us, you know, uh, we've covered, of course, the introduction to chapter two, up to chapter eight of the reading thus far. And if you were here, uh, you would know, again, that change is not always a bad thing. You think about everything around us changes from time to time. Seasons change. As we get older, we as a people change. However, sometimes we as a people struggle the most because the one thing that we despise the most is when the church changes. However, little do we know that the church has changed just tremendously in the last 20 years or so if we have paid any close attention to it. How has it changed? Let me tell you, there's a few ways as to how the church has changed. One, Sundays are no longer sacred. Many of us remember years ago that many of us could always assume that everyone was always going to somebody's church. We got up, we always all imagined, oh, where, what church are you going to? What church are you going to? We could always assume that everybody was going to church. However, in our present society, uh, people going to church is not something we could automatically assume in today's society. Why? Because people don't go to church like they used to. Why, again, Sundays are no longer sacred. But then we've had to deal with, the church has to deal with what we call busyness. Think about it, people are busy nowadays. Someone is always on vacation. Those of you who have kids, kids are perhaps always in sports. People are busy. So how's it changed? Sunday is no longer sacred. The church has had to deal with busyness. But then there's also what, they, what we may call the growing number of nuns. It is the idea that there is an increasing number of individuals who have no religious affiliation. Think about it, millennials connect with the church more different than how we connected with church. And because of that, there's a growing number of nuns. How else has it been different? We now live in a on-demand culture. Think about it. People don't always darken the doors of the church anymore. So at least, you know, and I think if anything, COVID taught us that the most people can experience God without ever darkening the doors of the local church. Nowadays, they can click online and watch online on their terms at their preferred times. So what does that mean? The church has changed. And if we are not careful, again, it's my belief that if we're not careful, Tom Rainer will write about us one day. So if you read the book, you would discover again, Rainer in essence offers his own spiritual autopsy uh, on churches who have died. And he also writes so that, in essence, so we don't follow in those churches' footsteps. So how does a church die, we may, you may ask? Well, he talks about in chapter 2, uh, the church can die if we are not careful, and it often dies. First, what takes place is what he calls slow erosion. Hear me tonight. Think about it. It's very rare for a long-term church member to see erosion in their church. I'll say it again. It's rare for a long-term church member to see erosion take place in their church. If you don't get it, let me put it this way. If you were a visitor without prior knowledge of this church, after coming one time, would you visit again? When you come as a visitor, what do you notice? Are the ushers mean? Do the greeters greet you? Are those who sit next to you, are, are they glad to be here? Or glad to know that you are here? If there's a sign of decline, it often shows erosion is taking place. Erosion can take place in many different ways. It can take place uh, in the physical facilities. Things are breaking down. Erosion takes place also by, perhaps by the lack of ministry engagement. Engagement. 
Just nothing is going on. We, we, we're, we're just existing. It, it, it could take place if we just come to church like business as usual. And so what Rainer says in essence is one of the ways that we, that we could tell that church is dying is that erosion is taking place. Again, we, we talked about in chapter 3 and 4, Rainer opened chapter 3 by describing how those churches that have died, they would die, why? Because the past were their heroes. And you, you know, if we're not careful, we'll try to make tomorrow look like yesterday. You, you know, we got the idea, you know, we, we've always done it this way. Therefore, we believe it can't be done any other way. You know, we get the saying, uh, my mother and father did it this way, so I'm going to do it this way. However, we learned that if God wanted the past to be present, God wouldn't let the past pass. And because God let the past pass, that, means, that often means that God wants us to experience something now and in the future that is better than what's in the past. However, if we're going to experience what? We can't make the past our hero. What does that mean? I'm not saying forget where we come from. I, I, I'm saying it just can't be a model for where we are headed. So we, we also talked about if we're going to continue to do what God has called us to do. We have to embrace the idea of the importance of community. Think about it, there's a difference between being a church in the community and being a community church. What's the difference? The difference is simple. Community churches think about community first and themselves second. But often we as church attendees, we often do the complete opposite. We think of ourselves first and everybody else last. And my point is, if we're going to be the church that God would be pleased with, we must embrace our, what? Community. But then in chapter 5, Rainer talks about the churches that have died, died, what? Because the budget moved inwardly. Think about it. If you want to know what a person values, you only need to see, only need to see two things. You only need to see their calendar and their checkbook. Why? It's because how you plan and budget will be seen in those two things. Can I tell you the same is actually true when we look at the church. If you and I follow the money, it will tell you where a church's heart is. It would often tell you where they spend money on. All you have to do is follow where it goes. So what does that mean? That means where the money is and where it is spent will tell you what that church values. How do we know? Uh, Rainer tells the story of Wellington Burt. Uh, if you haven't read it, read it in your own spare time. The sad reality, though, is that Bert was tight on his money. And what did what happened? He didn't want anybody else to have it. And think about it. Many churches across America are just like that. They want to have it, but they don't want to spend it. And as a result, what happens, we often do is what as a result of that, we often make money an idol. Oh, we have to have this much in the bank account. Why? Because in our minds, it's all about money. And the sad reality is there's many churches that have cash in the bank, but there's no ministry being done. And that's what happens often when the budget does what? Moves inwardly. When we become focused on ourselves instead of others. Then in chapter 6, we, we learn that we should always focus on, we should always focus on others. Why? Because the Great Commission, Great Commission commissions us to do so. Think about it. Acts 1, 8 tells us what? That you ought to be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Samaria. 
in all the uttermost parts of the world. And here's what I often tell other people. It's good to be a witness in all the uttermost parts of the world, but what good is it to be a witness in all the uttermost parts of the world, but you're not being a witness to the very neighborhood that you happen to be in? It's wonderful to do great things for the world, but it doesn't make much sense if we're not impacting the actual community that our church resides in. First Peter 3.15 tells us this way, but in your hearts we ought to revere Christ as Lord, and that we ought to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but he says but we ought to do this with gentleness and respect. Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 says, he says, we ought to do our best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be shamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Ephesians 2.10 says it this way, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. What, what am I saying? I'm saying us evangelizing and us sharing the gospel, teaching young men and women about, about God is the good works that God has commanded us to do. It is not optional. He commands us to do so. Ephesians 4.11 says, so Christ himself gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and some teachers. Romans 1.16 says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. He says, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. And in essence, what I'm trying to help you to understand is that these scriptures helps us to understand what the true mission of every church ought to be. And that is the mission is to reclaim those who are lost. Let me also suggest... It's easy over time for the church to lose its mission. Why? Because of complacency and comfort. It is the idea that often we develop what I call the me syndrome. You know, we got this idea, well, I'm saved. I don't need to do anything else. So often we try to treat salvation as a get out of hell free card. That because of that, we don't have to do anything else. However, God doesn't want us to, to subscribe to that notion. I'm saying that the best thing we can do is give others our God and help them see their life, that their life with Jesus is better. Thriving churches have the Great Commission as the centerpiece of their vision. Think about it. Any, any church that you probably can Google or recognize, if you went in there and, or took the time to even go there on a Sunday morning, you'd be surprised what, what their focus is on. It's often made, and it's often about, hey, we have to go make disciples. He says God instructs us to go, teach, baptize. It, it's really one imperative, but he gives three sub-imperatives. He says go, teach, and baptize. He says you've you got to go. For the church, in order to be filled, you and I must be willing to go. For whatever success you want to see in your church, it's only going to be predicated on our ability to go. But then he says, teach. Listen to me. You can't expect and think that every person who comes to the doors of this church knows church etiquette, uh, uh, knows uh, your own specific church traditions. He says, so, so, so you and I must be willing to teach. And here's the thing. We can't come to church wanting people to learn, but, we, but we're unwilling to teach them. He says, you and I got to be willing to teach. Think about it. There would be no reason for the church to be in existence if we didn't have nobody to teach. He says, go. Teach. But then he says, Baptize. He says, take, baptize. He says, those are what he calls us to do. Being a part of the Great Commission, he says, we've got to go, teach, and baptize. But then Rainer in chapter 7 gave us another symptom of a dying church. He calls it 
you, know, you we can often die if we end up becoming preference driven. You know, think about it. We all have preferences. Preferences is defined as our uh, desire or what we favor. Some of us prefer, you know, working through the day. Others of you may prefer to work at night. Some of you prefer to come to 8 o'clock service. Then others of you prefer to come to 10 o'clock service. Why? It's because that's your preference. Some of you prefer to live in the city. Others of you may prefer to live in the suburbs. Why? It, because everybody has preferences. And here's my prayer for our church, and that is my prayer is that we ought not allow our personal preference to get in the way that others can experience God. Maybe you didn't hear me, let me say again. We ought not allow our personal preferences to get in the way that others can't experience God. I'm, I'm, in this sense, I'm saying a church cannot survive long term when members are focused on their own preferences. Then in chapter 8, uh, Rainer shared another symptom that speaks to the decline of churches really all across America. His idea, he calls it pastoral tenure decreases. In essence, he talks about, think about, there are multiple reasons why pastors leave the church. Why, why, why do they leave the church? It's few, these are just a few reasons. Burnout. Pastors often work way too much. Then there's the idea of often pastors having to deal with unrealistic expectations. You know that perhaps the pastor has a family, but they have to, in essence, have two jobs to provide for their families. And depending on what church, there's some church in America that I tell a pastor, oh, if you can't be at the church all this time, then we don't need you. It's the idea of often people deal with unrealistic expectations. But then, oftentimes, there's also pastors have to deal with unhappiness. And when I speak of unhappiness, I'm speaking of how unhappiness often affects pastors' lives at home. You know, pastors have families, you know. And often the stress of ministry often falls on their families. That is how some, what we call PKs, better known as preacher's kids, often resent the church because oftentimes they may, have, they may see how the church has uh, treated they, they passed or in this case their father and or their mother and because of that there's the idea of unhappiness very few people I admit often leave the church because of low wages although let me be very clear the statistics often show that the average pastor in the prior to day society makes less than $50,000 not to mention pastoring just was announced by Forbes magazine is now considered the fourth, fourth most stressful job in America. And often these are just some, again, a few characteristics, and this is why there's a crisis in the clergy community, that America is experiencing a significant increase in the number of pastors considering or contemplating a career change. There's a decline. And now we get to chapters Nine and ten. Rainer helps us to see the issue with many churches, and that, that is many churches died. Why? Because they rarely prayed together. Chapter nine, Rainer talks about this conversation. He has with a gentleman who was seeming to be grieving the loss of his church, and Rainer asks the gentleman, Did the church pray together? I mean, I want to do a little reading of this book together. And if you don't mind, I want to read about two and a half pages. I want to start at page 63. So those of you who have the book, if those of you who want to follow along, I'm going to read at the beginning of page 63. Uh, this is what he says. He said, the man, again, the church really prayed together is what it's titled. He said, the man sitting across from me was not enjoying the moment. 
we were talking about a church he loved, and indeed the small group of two men and three women seemed ill at ease. We were talking about a church that died four years earlier. Mike was the first to respond. He still referred to it as his church. He was still having trouble letting go. He was still grieving. The last thing a grieving person needs is to be a part of an autopsy. We agreed to do so with hope that the process could help some other churches in the future. I told him that, that there was hope and, and the purpose of this book. So he answered my questions. He added insight. He spoke slowly and methodically like a person who was still grieving because he was. I asked him the question I asked of all the survivors of the deceased churches. Did the church members pray together? Inevitably, they paused. They weren't sure how to answer the question. You see, most of the churches, almost to the day, they shut the doors and had some type of prayer time. It may have been a part of the worship service. It may have been uh, with some type of fellowship like a Wednesday evening meal. Sure, we prayed together. The answer came in, in uh, 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 unanimously, but not with much enthusiasm. So I probed further. Scribe your prayer times. Scribe your prayer times. He requested. He said, he says that's where the revelation will come. That's where we discover together the question behind the question. And as they began to describe their prayer times together, they began to understand more clearly. Let's listen in one. Let's listen in one of those conversations and one one of the representatives of the most both of the responses. Dorothy spoke next. Oh yes, yeah, she said we prayed together as a church. We. We had a Wednesday night meal in prayer time. And when, when, we're, when we were larger, we were able to afford cooks to prepare our meals. But as we lost members, we had to go to potluck. It was a shame because we never knew what the other person to bring. I remember one night when we had 12 vegetables and, no, and one dessert, no meat, no bread. That was a shame. She had gotten off topic, so I guided her back. Tell me about the prayer time on Wednesday night, I asked. Well, she began somewhat thoughtfully. Carl would pass out a prayer list to all of us. And I interrupted her since I did not know Carl. And she continued, Carl was a deacon. And he had a copy machine at his office. And we used to have a church secretary type and copy those. But we had to let her go because we couldn't afford her. Carl just kind of picked up the slack there. You know, it's a sad day when we no longer had a full-time secretary. That was a shame. Again, I asked her to, re to return to the topic of prayer. And that's pretty much it. She said Carl would pass out the prayer list, and one person would have the blessing and prayer, would have the blessing and pray for those on the list. Then we would eat. Of course, one time we, would have, we, we had no meat or bread. That was a shame. It was at that point I asked the question, do you really think that was a meaningful time of prayer? Do you think that's how the New Testament churches pray? Inevitably, there would be a pause and then an admission. No, they said it was more like a routine or ritual. It would hardly qualify as corporate prayer in the New Testament sense. And then they would reflect, their eyes would open. They would remember those days when church members came together for, power, for powerful times of prayer and some recall 24-hour prayer emphasis that the church had. Those good old days of prayer typically coincided with the best days of the church, at least to the best of their recollection. Not, no coincidentally, prayer and the health of the church went hand in hand. When the church is engaged in meaningful prayer, it becomes both the cause and the result of greater church health. Hear me when I tell you. Hear the bottom line that Rainer is trying to present it. Was that the church didn't pray. Notice everyone was trying to change the subject when he asked the question, Did you do you pray? Oh, they say, Oh, here's the people on the prayer list. Here they were offering, again, excuses, but the church didn't pray. And oftentimes, I believe we try to treat prayer often as our spare tire and not the steering wheel. 
you know what I mean. I, we, we often use prayer as our last resort. We try to do everything on our own. And then when everything else don't work out, then we pray. And you know, I've discovered in churches, we do a whole lot of bumping and shouting, but we don't pray enough. And here's my, here's, let me be very clear. I love a good worship. Be up, let me be very clear. Worship has its place in worship. But we don't, we don't pray. And it's my prayer that many of us are suffering because we don't take time to pray. We, we, we're excited again when the choir sings. But when, he's, but when we say it's time to pray, our passion becomes lukewarm. I mean, it, the, the crescendo could be here in the moment somebody says it's time to pray, you just go all the way back down. We can dance and shout about everything else, but we don't have that same spirit when it comes time to pray. Think about it. I want you to know the scripture speaks to the importance of prayer. Philippians 4, 6 says it this way, that we ought not be anxious about anything. But he says, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, he says what? We ought to let our requests be made known to God. Colossians 4, 2 says it this way, that we ought to continue steadfastly in prayer. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Psalm 145, 18 says it this way. The Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. For 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says we ought to pray without ceasing. James 5, 16 says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Then he says the prayer of a righteous person has a has great power as it is working. Ephesians 6.18 says it this way, that praying at all times in spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, he says, we ought to keep alert with all uh, perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Mark 11.24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer... He says, believe you have received it, and what? It will be yours. Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. James 5, 13, if anyone among you is suffering, he says, let him pray. And as if anyone is cheerful, let him sing praises. Romans 8, 26, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. But for we do not know what to pray for as we are. He says, but the spirit himself, what will it do? Intercede for us with growings too deep for words. Luke 18, 1. And he told them a parable to the fact that they ought to do what? Always pray. And not lose heart. I know that's a whole lot of Bible. But my, here's the whole point. These scriptures helps us to see how important prayer really ought to be for the believer. And then Rainer shows the connection biblically in Acts 2.42. The Bible says, what did they do? The Bible says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Some of y'all not hear me. I'm going to read it real slow because I really want you to get this. What did they do? They, he says they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Now, here's my thing. We often follow the fellowship part. We often follow the breaking of bread part. Some may even say we don't even do that enough. But we often miss it when it comes to prayer. Charles Spurgeon says it this way, I, I know of no better thermometer to your spiritual temperature than this. He says, the measure of the intensity of your prayer. I'm going to say it again. He says, I know of no better thermometer to your spiritual temperature than this. He says, the measure of the intensity of your prayer. In essence, Spurgeon says, uh, he says, I I know how warm you are as a believer by how you pray. He said, but I also know the flip. He says, I know how cold you are 
as a believer by the absence of when you don't. Rainer helps us to understand churches that die because they rarely pray together. They would often I mean we often repeat that a, a church that prays together stays together. And here's my only thing: if we don't, if we don't, if if that's the case, why we don't do it together? Listen to me tonight. Whatever we want to see in our church, I'm saying that it will only take place when we pray. I'm saying we got to be willing to take prayer seriously. But then Rainer moves to chapter 10. And another symptom in which he explains as to why the church dies, he calls it that the church had no clear purpose. Uh, allow me to read pages 71 to 73. Let's listen to what he says. He, it is, he says it's considered to be one of the great American victories in the history of the Olympics. He said the United States hockey, hockey team was not supposed to have a chance in 1980. The Soviet Union seemed invincible and unbeatable. Their team included elite professionals who had played together for years. The Americans, on the other hand, had teammates who had never played together. None of them were professionals. They had come from colleges and universities across America. The American, the American victory over the Soviets in the medal round seemed improbable, if not impossible. According to the movie, based on these unlikely heroes, the turning point for the Americans came in a practice led by Coach Herb Brooks. The coach was demanding, perhaps, were, were, the coach was demanding, perhaps driven to a fault. Brooks was not happy with the play of the team, so he had the players skating, uh, skating sprints to the point of exhaustion. Some of the assistant coaches were worried that the players would either pass out or quit. They urged Brooks to stop. Brooks pressed forward. And during the practices, Brooks would, oft, would ask a player, who did you play for? The player would respond proudly with the name of his college. Brooks was asking the same question during this practice of total exhaustion. One of the hockey players recalling Brooks' persistent question looked from his prostrate position after his last sprint, gasping for breath. He declared, I play for the United States of America. It was a defining moment. They got it. They did not play for the desperate college, uh, colleges from which they came. They played for the United States of America. The team responded that they would beat the mighty Soviets in the first game of the medal round, and they would ultimately beat Finland for the gold medal. Some say the victory over the Soviet Union was the greatest Olympic victory ever for the Americans. Others say it was the greatest moment in American sports. Most everyone who was alive in 1980 sure remembers the miracle on ice. American hockey players got it. They not only knew the game they were playing, they knew for whom they were playing. I play for the United States of America. They clearly understood their purpose. They clearly understood how to carry out their purpose. That is certainly not the, not the case with those churches that were dying when I interviewed former members of the deceased churches. They referred to their last years in sad and similar ways. We were going through the motions. Everything we did seemed to be like we were in a rut or a bad routine. We became more attached to our ways of doing church than we did asking the Lord what he wanted us to do. We were playing a game called church. We had no idea what we, what we were supposed what we were really supposed to be doing. We stopped asking what uh, we should be doing for fear that it will re require too much effort or change. Do you get the picture? The church was not really a church; it had no purpose. Did you catch it? The American hockey players got it. They not only knew the game. They were playing. They knew for whom they were playing for. Unfortunately, the issue with many of us, and I'm almost done, is that we're just going through the motion. That we are forgotten at times for who we're playing for. But you know, I want you to hear me tonight. We're not playing uh, that the church would be full, although if the church became full, that's wonderful, but that's not who we're playing for. Because we want to grow as a church, we want to grow numerically and financially. That's wonderful, but that's not what we are playing for. We ought to be playing to make sure we find ways to reclaim the lost. 
Here's the thing. Those churches who have died got caught up and were more attached to the ways of them doing church than asking the Lord what he wanted them to do. In essence, I think Rainer said it best. They were playing a game called church. And if we be honest, I, I would argue many of us are doing the very same thing. We play church rather than actually being the church. And any time we play church and instead of being the church, we become purposeless. In essence, they, they were just doing what they've always done. And what did they say? When you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. However, Paul debunks this idea and he speaks about the purpose of the church in Philippians 1 verses 3 through 5. No, 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 notice what he says. Uh, he said, he says, did you read clearly why he was thankful? It is the last portion of the sentence. If you read it in your own spare time, read Philippians 1 verses 3 through 5. This is, notice the, the last portion of the sentence. He says, because your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Notice the church here at Philippi understood her purpose. The members at Philippi knew what they were supposed to do. What, what was their purpose? Their purpose was to live the gospel and they were to proclaim the gospel. Let me say it again. They were to live the gospel and proclaim the gospel. That, that's my problem with the church. You've heard me say it, and I'll say it again. We often hear the gospel. You often hear the gospel preached, but we don't live the gospel that we've heard. And that was the last phrase. He says, Paul says, from the first day until now. Don't, don't, don't run through that too fast. And that's the Philippian church. Uh. They understood their purpose. He says, from, from, the, he says, from the day the church started until, until now, Paul wrote this letter. He says, they knew what they were supposed to do. And here is my question, and I'm done. Have we forgotten what we're supposed to do? Have our passion for God, has it become lukewarm? hear me tonight the purpose of the church is for you and I to go fishing for the Lord at least I'm grateful I at least have a baby to help me uh, it's supposed to go fishing and I hear what you say I've been fishing for a long time But here, the reality still is you and I still have a job and a duty to fulfill. I'm saying there are individuals that are drowning in the deep waters of sin and life that needs to be caught. And it is our duty to go and to proclaim the gospel to them. That's the purpose and should be the purpose of every church. We have to have what, what I would like to call a dissatisfaction spirit. Yeah, we, we doing okay, but we could, can be doing, but we can do better. The question becomes, will you and I go fishing for the Lord? Are there any questions? Well, oh, wonderful. Uh, to God be praised. Uh, for those of you who are worshiping with us online, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, but if there isn't any questions, come on, let's stand. If you have a gift to give back to the Lord, uh, you can do so uh, on your way out. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, yeah. The church... Yeah, let me just run through it quickly. The church died because they really prayed together. We often treat prayer like our spare tire. Uh, 
instead of our strength will. Many of us suffer because we don't take time to pray. And when we desire, and whatever we desire for our church will only take place when we take prayer seriously. Church died because it had no purpose. American hockey players got it. They not only knew the game, they knew to whom they were playing for. The church at Philippi understood their purpose. They were to live the gospel and they were to proclaim the gospel. There are individuals that are drowning in the deep waters of sin in life that, that needs to be called in, and it is our duty to go and proclaim the gospel to them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for every household represented, Lord. But even thank you, even Lord, for those who may want to be here but couldn't make it, Lord. We pray that you bless that you bless us and we pray that you continue to guide our minds and hearts that we'll continue to do the work that you called us to do and now Lord as we prepare to leave this place but never from your presence we pray that you bless us and keep us and these things we ask in your darling son Jesus name amen amen, amen. have a wonderful night